beaming across the counties of Essequibo, Demerara, and Burbese, this is Kaicho Radio 99.1 and 99.5 FM. Kaicho Radio, the radio with a difference. Now it's 30 in Guyana and it is time to enter room 592 with Dr. Yog Mahadio and senior journalist of Kaitro News, Leonard Gildari. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Kevin Smith. Good evening, Joshua. And good evening to Sir Ronald Saunders, sir. Welcome to room 592. Thank you very much. And Leonard, my co-host, welcome to you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen all across Guyana, the USA, Caribbean, and wherever you're joining us from, welcome to Room 592, where we unleash the truth. And as we pay careful attention to the elections and the goings on in Guyana, we must be mindful of what is happening in the rest of the world as we share our concerns with our brothers and sisters in New York, in Minneapolis, in Washington, and our support of course is with the right things happening people and human rights must be heeded and adhered to but we want to turn our attention in room 592 to the guyana situation and ladies and gentlemen tonight we have a distinguished guest mr sir ronald saunders he is an ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of the united states and the oas Sir Ronald is a non-resident High Commissioner to Canada for Antigua and Barbuda, and his CV is extremely impressive, ladies and gentlemen. To you youngsters out there, I pause to mention this to you. When you grow up, you want to be like Sir Ronald. As I relate to you, as I relate to you, that Sir Ronald is a diplomat, a businessman, academic, negotiator, mediator, as well as a market strategist for business and the politics. He has served as the president of the Permanent Council of the OAS. He's led a mission to Haiti, guess why? To look and to help with their constitutional and political impasse. He has vast private sector involvement and in the public sector was the chairman of the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force against drug trafficking and money laundering. He served UNESCO in various portfolios, has a long diplomatic career since 1982, and is the recipient of several honors, including Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, as well as Knight Commander of the Order of the Nation, KCN, member of the Order of Australia. He was honored by the University of West Indies with a doctorate, uh, honorary degree of Doctor of Letters for his championship of Caribbean causes as a diplomat, writer, and advocate. And here is why, ladies and gentlemen, to the young people across Guyana, here is why I said when you grow up, you want to be like Sir Ron. He was born in Guyana. This is Guyanese. And we have a true son of the soil that we must be proud of. Guess what? Sir Ron has advised and has withstood probably pressures from as many countries and organizations as one could imagine. He was a public affairs advisor to the Burnham administration in the 1970s. Managing director of the Guyana Broadcasting Service was himself a broadcaster program director and served as probably a master with all talents in that portfolio before he left in 1997. President of the Caribbean Broadcasting Union. And if you were following Sir Ronald's writings, you would have been well acquainted with some of the history that he would have been share, sharing out of his knowledge, his intimate knowledge of Guyana's history and the Guyana power brokers and those who wielded power. Sir Ron, as we say, welcome to room 592, sir. I must say you have been extremely open and transparent in, the, in your work and the expression of your thought. And I want to bring this right up to you, sir, to ask you to, to make some opening comments, but I want to throw this to you and the viewers out there. Viewers, this distinguished gentleman once called on the Harvard University to recognize its history and its debt to human beings enslaved in the creation of the Celsius University. 
And to quote, he said to the university, quote, one tangible way in which the university and Harvard Law School should show remorse and repay its debt in a small way while living up to the high, high ideals it proclaims is to offer scholarships to Antiguans and Barbudans on an annual basis. Sir, you have been passionate representing the people who seek your service and of course representing human rights. Welcome to this room 592, sir. As I open for a few comments from you and ask you to tell us about this incident when you're called out Harvard Law School. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear on you. And may I say hello to uh, Mr. Gil Harry, uh, who at one point uh, was the recipient of my uh, weekly commentaries, uh, when, which are syndicated, but published in Guyana by Kite Your News. Uh, we had uh, a brief but very fruitful relationship before um, uh, others replaced him in that capacity, and he moved on to what looks like bigger and better things. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so so let, let me first of all recognize him and say hello. And uh, I, again, to say that uh, I welcome this opportunity to talk with you. If I may briefly remark on the matter of Harvard University, which you raised, Harvard University's law school, for which it was known internationally for over two centuries, uh, was built, Harvard University was built on its law school for over two centuries, for its business school became the predominant factor in the university's existence. Now, Harvard Law School was built on the back and the blood, the debts, and, and that debts is spelled D-E-A-T-H-S, of Antiguan slaves, who were owned by a man called Royal, on a huge estate on Antigua, and he eventually sold that estate after committing some of the most heinous acts against uh, the, slave, the enslaved population uh, before he left Antigua to return to Massachusetts, uh, from which his from where his family came, he actually broke on the wheel and drew and, and drawn and, and drew and quartered the man who is now Antigua's national hero, the first national hero of the country. Uh, now, were it not for Royal giving money. Harvard University that uh, financed the chair of the law school, that law school would never have been built. And it would never have today been the law school which has produced presidents of the United States, secretaries of state of the United States, and indeed chief justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. So the university is also now today extremely wealthy. Its uh, reserves are in the billions of dollars. Uh, its, its size in terms of its financing is twice or three times the size of the entire economy of Antigua and Barbuda. Wow. Uh, a debt was owed and a debt had to be paid. And it was on that debt that I called upon the presidency of, the, of Harvard University to do something about as uh, the, the fourth landed campus of the University of the West Indies, which was established in Antigua in September of last year. This is a nascent university campus. Uh, it needs building up in order to serve the hundreds of thousands of students of the Eastern Caribbean. And where better a place to start looking for uh, the kind of financing that the university campus would need to raise up the quality and standard of life of those young people mm -hmm. that a place that has owed Antigua a debt for many centuries, Harvard University. Well, the reason, one of the reasons viewers and listeners that, you know, I've raised that is because many times, Sir, Sir Ron, many times, the, the younger generation, we tend to lose sight of what is our history. We tend to lose sight of the, of the, the sacrifices, our fair, 
poor parents and and you know maybe more grandparents would have been made, made and the other thing that i feel that we lose sight of is the fact that many men like yourself and many other men and women are working hard each day to put our peoples on a pedestal and brothers and sisters when distinguished gentlemen like this strive work hard to put us on a pedestal we can do a little bit to stay on that pedestal guyana is now has always been a part of the world village the global uh, the global village so to speak but it's how we conduct ourselves that will either put to waste the work of distinguished gentlemen like sir ron or make them feel proud of us are we able to take the button forward or not and tonight sir ron has joined us and we want to come right down to the present sir ron if you don't mind and as we discuss uh, your ideas and your views sir of course we got to talk a little bit about elections 2020 so Ron, I want to take you to uh, after the infamous March 4th so-called declaration. You would have said, sir, in an article that should the Guyana general elections be declared and a government established without blessing of the international organizations, you basically called it without that blessing, it would not be recognized. You said that Guyana could face suspension from the Commonwealth and other organizations, sir. The people of Guyana would have heard the political leaders talking about there can be sanctions. And there are some of our politicians would said, what are sanctions? There are not going to be any sanctions. If you can spend a couple of moments, educate us as to the seriousness of what you wrote here. Suspension from Commonwealth and such organizations. What does it mean to Guyana, sir? Well, first of all, let's look back at Guyana. Uh, Guyana came independence in 1966 as you know in difficult circumstances it was a birth that had uh, begun many years before but the interests of external forces concerned about Guyana uh, created in a sense the divisions that we have seen today uh, manifesting themselves in different ways uh, the United States government uh, didn't want what they considered to be a communist government in Guyana on the Cherry Jagan uh, because they feared at the time, as they put it, that there would be a second Cuba in uh, their hemisphere. Uh, Kennedy was very concerned about the fact that Fidel Castro had come to office in 1960 by way of a coup d'etat. But after a, a vicious and brutal government, a dictatorship, which had close links to the mafia uh, in the United States, ran that country uh, into the ground. Uh, people had no rights. Education was uh, a preserve of a few. The wealthy uh, owned more than 90% of the country. Uh, black people in Cuba counted for nothing. Uh, and Castro rose up against that. Now, interestingly, Castro didn't start off being a supporter of the Soviet Union. Indeed, he was not a communist. His first port of call when he was looking for help was the United States of America. And uh, I had the inside story of a conversation that uh, took place in the White House uh, by a man called Richard Goodwin, uh, who, if anybody Googles his name, we'll see that Goodman was once uh, a legal advisor uh, to the White House uh, during the Kennedy administration. And um, as a joke, uh, Goodman had suggested to Kennedy that maybe we should find a different kind of leader for Guyana than British Guyana, unless we ended up with, a, with another Cuba. That joke turned out to be quite serious. Uh, history of Guyana is replete with the shenanigans between uh, Kennedy on the one hand and the British Prime Minister who was reluctant to proceed with what was being said to him and that was to fix a system that would ensure that Jerry Jagan did not come to power. Uh, as it turned out, uh, those factors defined Guyana's politics because we then had a nationalist party uh, led by 
Jagan and, and Bordham, uh, two very charismatic men who had taken the country that far uh, to get it out of the clutches of colonialism, make Guyana a nation uh, that could make a reality of what Sir Walter Raleigh and others had talked about, and that is El Dorado. Precisely, indeed, where Guyana is at the moment, on the cusp of that El Dorado, though of a different kind, this time oil, uh, not gold. But that those shenanigans from outside powers define Guyana and uh, Guyana's politics, and unfortunate, unfortunately is led to where we are. It is a matter for me of great concern and trouble that Guyana has not been able in all these years of my life uh, to be able to overcome the racial differences which in a sense has influenced its politics. Those of us who went to school as children in Guyana, and I was certainly one of them, uh, and I was Georgetown based, uh, know that the people I went to school with were of all races, black, Indian, Chinese, uh, expatriate whites, Portuguese, the lot. And we enjoyed nothing better than going to each other's religious celebrations. If it was Eid, we went for the food. If it was uh, Pagmo, we enjoyed the, 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 the mixing and the throwing of a beer on each other. We enjoyed Christmas to the full. We all went together into the to the cinemas. For me, it was the pit. Uh, the pit being, I don't know if it still exists in Guyana, but the pit was where young schoolboys went with, uh, we bought tickets for two cents and, uh, in those days, uh, five cents if there was a really a good double on and uh, the cinema was intent on making money. But it was people of all races. We had no, we didn't define each other in the context of color. We defined each other in the context of the relationship we had, and that boiled down to character, the persons you liked, because they were who they, they were, not uh, and what they were as as people, not what they were as color. And it is unfortunate that uh, that difference that existed, uh, manipulated by outside forces, in and brought into Ghana, that the leadership of our country allowed that to continue over time. And you know what I said, I, our country, because even though I am the ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda, and I have lived and served three governments in Antigua and Barbuda for 41 years, Guyana is the place of my birth, and it is not something that I treat casually. I care very deeply about the fact that my formative years were started there. And if I am anything, uh, it is because of those years that defined me. It is why I pride myself on not having a racist bone in my body and for hating it when I see it, for disliking it intensely and for acting against it in every forum in the world in which I have ever had the opportunity to represent nations. Thank you, Sir Ron. And so where we are today as a country then, uh, it could uh, obviously affect and upset um, the balance. I mean, in terms of CARICOM, there has been so much work that past governments across the Cari Caribbean countries, across Caribbean, would have worked to create such platforms like Commonwealth. Uh, well, Commonwealth has been there for another purpose, but CARICOM itself, and of course, Guyana, as you mentioned, Guyana is on, on, on that uh, admirable plateau now where we can only lift off, where we can only get better, better than we ever thought we could have been. But, sir, you're right to mention, if, if we're not careful, then we are not going to get a lift off that we all know that we can have. And that's because of, of us descending into things that we ought not to descend into, racial uh, matters and politics that is race-based. Sir Ron, what's your thought with regards to, I want to come right down to this elections, if you don't mind, sir, because on, uh, uh, 
it, I think in January 2019, you, you wrote, and I have been following your articles, and, um, you know, soon after the NCM, uh, you wrote that Guyana is in a precarious position. So consistently, Saron, you have been keeping your fingers on the pulse, and you have been writing and sending your signals of how we should go forward. Unfortunately, we have not, we have not paid heed to your advisor. Look, uh, Guyana is at a difficult point right now. If the current general elections are not seen by the international community, uh, if the result of those elections are not seen by the international community to be credible, there is going to be action against those who allow that situation to take place and worse for those who are actually involved in it. Let's look across the board at what the likely scenario will be. First of all, Guyana is a member nation of the, of the Commonwealth. Uh, what happens in the Commonwealth if a country runs afoul of the charter of the Commonwealth, to which every member nation of the Commonwealth says it adheres to, is that they, they will be there will be a meeting of the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group. Now, the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group is authorized by the heads of government of the, of the Commonwealth to look at situations in countries and to determine whether those countries have violated the charter in a persistent way or in such an egregious way that it warrants action being taken against that country. Now, Guyana itself has been a member of the Commonwealth uh, Ministerial Action Group in relation to other countries. Um, uh, and as you know, the Commonwealth has suspended Pakistan in the past. It, has, it's, uh, it actually suspended Pakistan twice. It suspended Zimbabwe, which remains, remains suspended from the Commonwealth to this day. Uh, it suspended um, uh, Fiji twice again for elections and uh, for, uh, for military coups, for putting in place governments that were not elected. Uh, and if it turns out that the result of the recount that is happening in Guyana now does not produce a government that is reflective of the majority vote of that recount, then I'm afraid Guyana will go before the Commonwealth Ministerial Action and action will be taken. Now you may say that suspension from the Commonwealth for Guyana means nothing, uh, that it will get on with its life in the world, but that is not true. When you are listed as a country in the world that is suspended by the Commonwealth of Nations, and remember these are 53 countries that span the globe. Uh, they cross every continent. They are, con they are countries, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, uh, India, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Pakistan that I mentioned before, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, it's a wide spectrum of countries that will look upon Guyana askance and will not treat with it in the manner that Guyana itself would like to be treated. Guyana will also lose an important voice in the Commonwealth, where on issues that matter to Guyana, it can speak to those uh, 53 heads of government on an equal basis. So, uh, war Guyana in the uh, today, uh, President Granger could talk to Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom on a one-to-one -one basis, equal and straight. Uh, they have an equal vote in the in the in the in the Commonwealth. If you are excluded from the Commonwealth, that's one of the things you're excluding yourself from. So it will make a difference then uh, in the organization of American states. Again, uh, Guyana is likely to be raised before the prominent council of the organization of American states if those election results do not produce a leadership of the country that comes out of the majority vote of that recount. And uh, that means that Guyana 
risks also being suspended from the organization of American states, but not just being su just not just being suspended. The organization of American states itself will have to determine what other action it may take uh, at a bilateral level of its 33 member states acting against Guyana. And uh, it will only take one or two of those countries to decide that sanctions should be imposed. And remember, both the United States and Canada are members of the OS for other countries to follow. Now, again, uh, people may say, well, these sanctions don't matter. Well, they do, because they give the country a stench and a taint uh, that is not good for it. It makes it also re removes you from yet another international organization. So you're not part of the Commonwealth and you're not part of the most influential hemispheric organization, uh, organization in our hemisphere, and that is the OS. So those things matter. Then, of course, there are bilateral sanctions that might be taken. And uh, countries could start with uh, refusing to issue visas to some persons who are participants in what they might consider to be electoral fraud, those persons will have their visas seized. As the sanctions escalate, it could lead to a situation which um, their properties, if they have any in Canada and the United States, could be frozen and uh, they won't have access to bank accounts or to anything they own. And then, of course, it could spread to their families because the way in which this works is that people calculate that uh, people who are sanctioned will move their property, including their money, into the hands of their close family members. Uh, that's not an escape route uh, because your close family members are also subject to that kind of thing. Now, let's assume that despite all of that, people uh, stay in the government of, and decide they're going to run the country as they wish, um, even though not with not at the will of the people and even though illegally there will be other sanctions then against their government activity and it will start with sanctions against state-owned enterprises um, and that will mean sanctions against any enterprise in Guyana that happens to own oil uh, the money that would have come to that state enterprise will get frozen and uh, the Guyana government will not be able to touch it now, I'm not making this up. Uh, you could look at the history of several other countries, including neighboring Venezuela, to see what has happened with their assets as sanctions have been, as sanctions has escalated against them. Uh, but ultimately, you're a pariah state, uh, functioning in international community as a pariah state means you have no, you have no access to anybody of any influence. Uh, you, you, people look at you as if you are tainted. What kind of respect does that bring to the country? And indeed, what kind of respect and regard does it bring to the persons who are parading in that fashion? So, in a nutshell, if I were to give anybody any advice, I would say, make sure that Guyana and you do not end up in a situation in which sanctions are applied to you, are against you by international organizations or by powerful bilateral governments, because that's not a battle you can win. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's go over to Mr. Leonard Gillary. Leonard? Yeah, thank you very much, sir, Ron, and I'm so glad to see you. I was a little grieved uh, by Dr. Yog Mahadio not playing up a little more your foray into journalism and your broadcasting experience here. I would have been a little more happy had he done that because I was just looking at the picture, I think, last week. Saw so Ron Sanders, General Manager, Terry Holder, uh, Vivian Harris, Harrison, Matthew Allen, Pancho Caru. I think the younger folks might not know them, but they were very popular broadcasters. And standing next to them was Sir Ron Sanders. You weren't sure back in those days, but very nice picture. Everybody with a glass in their hands. Very happy times. But sorry, I want to bring you, your attention to the Caribbean and Guyana. And so we see Suriname uh, last week had a, an elections. We would have seen St. Kitts also and Nevis. 
they would have also blocked or reportedly blocked the entry of OAS stating the COVID-19 situation here. I want to ask you whether there's a fear within the region that maybe what is happening again could spread? Well, I think there there is a, it's not a fear that it will spread. I think what's happening in the region is that what has happened in Guyana, nobody wants to see repeated. That's the important thing. Um, uh, because the CARICOM has committed itself to a charter of civil rights. I know it's not a charter that most people know exists, but it does exist. And it is a charter that was signed on to by all the governments of CARICOM, including Guyana, and also by the private sector and other, sec and other sectors of society in each of our countries. Now, it sets out some very clear things. One of the things that it sets out is that we believe as a group in democracy, and we believe in free and fair elections. But more than that, we demand that there be free and fair elections and that those free and fair elections reflect the will of the majority of the people who form a government. We also don't accept that uh, anybody has the right to rule a country at the point of a gun or by the use of the military. And that uh, for people must be given free expression at uh, general elections, at the ballot box, to express their political viewpoint in terms of which party they wish to be the government for the next five years. Those are the things to which we are all committed. What has happened in Guyana uh, has, is, of course, happened in Guyana before. Guyana has been a perennial problem for Caribbean. More than any other nation in the war, in the, the whole of the region, Guyana has been a problem for CARICOM. Uh, CARICOM uh, sent uh, a group down before to sort of one general election, which resulted in the Herdmanster Accord, as you will recall. Mm -hmm. um, five prime ministers went to Guyana immediately after the March 2nd election to try to ensure that what came out of the election was something that everybody found palatable, that it reflected the will of the people. As Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados said, uh, as chairman of CARICOM, every vote must be counted and every vote must count. But count to do what? Count to put in office a government that the majority of the people of Guyana elected for or five years. If they are fed up with them after five years, if they found that they couldn't perform, if they found that they think did things with, uh, that were not right, a uh, very simple way of getting rid of them, just vote them out. That's what happens in other CARICOM countries. And that thing is extremely dear to the Caribbean. But we go a little further now. Uh, CARICOM has been saying to organizations like the Organization of American States and others uh, that issues within our region can be solved within our region by we ourselves. And CARICOM has put itself in the forefront of, the, of what is happening in Guyana. Therefore, CARICOM has a stake in the outcome of what happens in Guyana. If we do not end up in Guyana with a credible election result, CARICOM itself will have to decide what it does about Guyana. Because it can, CARICOM cannot have suspended Guyana from the Commonwealth as a member of the Commonwealth. Because remember, there are 12 CARICOM countries that are also members of the Commonwealth. There are 14 CARICOM countries that are also members of the Organization of American States. If these two bodies in which the Car CARICOM participates takes action against uh, against a government in Guyana that has not been properly and credibly elected, CARICOM will have to do the same thing. But what does that mean? Will CARICOM suspend Guyana and keep the headquarters of CARICOM in Turkey? I doubt that very much. Uh, it, it would mean an upheaval uh, in all of the arrangements. Um, now, it can be done, but what will happen as a result of it is that CARICOM will regard Guyana as a pariah, as a woman. Now, is that, is that the destiny Guyana wants? Is that the future that our young people should look forward to? 
I, I think not. Uh, Guyana has always been a leader in international affairs in the Caribbean. Guyana has always been a leader in Caribbean affairs. Remember the idea of CARICOM more emerged out of the head of Lyndon Forbes, Samson Burnham in the wake of the West Indian Federation, which had collapsed in, in 1962 and of which Guyana was not a part. Yet he joined with Baru, or the then Prime Minister of Barbados, and V.C. Byrne, the then Premier of Antigua, in casting a pebble into the Caribbean Sea. That pebble was Carifta. Three countries eventually led to, Car to Carifta with uh, 12 countries, and now to CARICOM with 15. Now, those were, the, those were Guyana ideas. Those were things Guyana worked for. The African Caribbean and Pacific, uh, uh, the African Caribbean Pacific Movement, the ACP group, born in Guyana in 1972. The uh, the effort that has been made uh, in international affairs to make the Caribbean a place where which should be counted in the world started in Guyana, and the participants in Guyana are legion, and we know who they are. Uh, and they're people of whom we've been extremely proud. And incidentally, they have been of all races of Guyana. And the same thing with the West Indian cricket team, the University of the West Indies, every Caribbean institution that you can think about, Guyana has been an integral part of it. Even uh, the Caribbean Court of Justice, the only woman who's ever served as a judge on that court was from Guyana. That's the kind of quality and distinction to get that Guyana has always had. That's the currency that Guyana has had in the world. It is hard currency. It is valued currency. Why would Guyana want to throw that away or allow anybody to allow Guyana to be in that position? There is no need for it. Hopefully this recount will be respected by all of the parties and whichever party comes out as the winner of that recount should be a judge, the government of the country. That is what the international community expects, and I hope that is what will happen. Thank you very much. You? Yes. Thank you, Sir Ron. Um, Sir Ronald, you, you mentioned that, yes, indeed, Guyana might have been, would have been a concern to, to the leaders across the region for a number of things. Uh, there, un, undeniably, Guyana's vast economic potential has continued to probably be one of the main attraction for the entire Caribbean. I mean, we have we have cast aside our ability to be the breadbasket of the Caribbean, which would have started way back during your time. Uh, we have put that aside, expediency oil took over. And, you know, now with oil even, we do stand the unique opportunity of being a leader in CARICOM. Sir, your take on, on the economic spin now, because if Guyana doesn't get this election right, it's not just the sanction, is it? but you're, we are literally going to kill all of our economic uh, opportunities, aren't we? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I just let me just say something else in relation to Guyana and Caribbean. Uh, you say quite rightly that Guyana would be a great economic opportunity uh, for the region. And in many ways, it's not just economic. Uh, Guyana holds many possibilities uh, for the region in other ways. But I will remind you of this. In the days when Guyana's economy was in the doldrums, in the days when people uh, could not scratch a living together uh, in the country, in the days when refugees from Guyana were literally that, refugees, people leaving the country with $5 in their pocket, not because they only had $5, but because $5 is all they were allowed to take. Uh, in those times, it was the Caribbean that became the home of Guyanese. I would remind you that Antigua, the Antiguan population is the size it is because almost half of it is people from Guyana. And incidentally, people of all races in Gu from Guyana. And if you go to Barbados, you will find a sizable number of Guyanese. If you go to Trinidad and Tobago, you will find a sizable number of Guyanese. Almost every place to which you go in the region 
Guyanese are there. So Guyanese mixed with these, uh, with these communities. There was a time, incidentally, when Vincentians and the St. Lucians came to Guyana to settle. And they worked agriculture along the Linden Highway and into that area. Um, at, uh, at one point, when people began to leave Guyana in droves, Many of those of their children who were born in, in Guyana went back to St. Lucia and St. Vincent. Today, you can walk down, you can go into the markets in St. Lucia and St. Vincent, and you will see a St. Lucia and a St. Vincent, Vincentian, but they talk with Guyanese accents. And they talk with Guyanese accents because their parents are Guyanese, or they themselves were born in Guyana. So the linkages with, between CARICOM and Guyana are real and they go back a very long way. There are links of blood, there are links of people uh, today. Uh, the, the children and grandchildren of Guyanese are nationals of other countries in the region. Now, Guyana is still, still has the potential for being the breadbasket of the region, still has the potential. Guyana produces, is a net exporter of food. You produce more food than you can eat. I've seen myself, uh, I've witnessed food being thrown away in Guyana, when there are countries in the Caribbean that have to import that food from as far away as, uh, as the United States. And Guyana could be supplying that food. It's what, you know, it didn't happen for many reasons. It's not only that, in, in a sense, it's not just Guyana's fault. It's the region's fault because we did not have or try to develop the shipping that, uh, the refrigerated ship, shipping that could take food from Guyana into other parts of the region. But since Guyana was the, was the country producing that food, it was a greater obligation upon Guyana to try to get the food into the Caribbean. Because not only were you satisfying a need, you were also going to make a lot of money out of it. The Caribbean region today imports over $5 billion of food five billion even if Guyana had a fifth of that market it was a billion dollars us that could come to Guyana given the right circumstances now that opportunity is not gone because if the oil industry uh, produces the kind of money that Guyana anticipates it will do Guyana will be able to invest in those ships that can take that food down to the Caribbean and give you a ready-made market it will also bring down the price of food to the Caribbean, and it will give the Caribbean greater food security because the food is coming from one of their own countries and not from a country that could cut off supplies at any time it wished to do so. Now, other opportunities for Guyana, Guyana will have more money given the size of its population than frankly it can spend even if it wished to build a school in every village and a hospital in every major city, Guyana will not be, have the absorptive capacity to spend the amount of money that it can earn for more, which means it should be investing that money uh, in other forms of return, because at some point, oil is going to run out, as Trinidad and Tobago has discovered. So you make arrangements for the future. That's why there's a heritage fund fun, but it's also why you should invest in other parts of the Caribbean in things that could pay you money down the road. Invest in tourism, uh, in countries in the Caribbean, for instance. Um, invest in other aspects of the Caribbean uh, economies that will make Guyana have several bows, several arrows to its bow. It will give you a wider arsenal. All of these things are opportunities for Guyana. Now, what are the opportunities for CARICOM? CARICOM is going to be plagued as time goes on by the ravages of climate change. We've seen it happen already. In 2017, in Antigua and Barbuda, we had to evacuate every single Barbuda from the island and bring them to Antigua when Hurricane Irma went by because it had crushed every single dwelling place, every house and every office. There was no place for people to hide. And there was another hurricane on its way behind it. 
Now, they became the first climate refugees in the Caribbean. Then we saw it happen last year in the Abaco Islands in, and Grand Bahama in the Bahamas, where again there had to be mass evacuation. People are dead from that, uh, that hurricane in the Bahamas that up to today, nobody knows quite how many there were. Now the question is, as climate change gets worse, and there is no reason to believe it will get any better, because we are already at the temperature uh, that will cause increased global warming and erosion of coastal areas and islands that we that is safe. People had said we'd reach there by 2050. We've now advanced that uh, that period. It's probably going to be a lot earlier. So the question is, where are all those people going to go? Well. The truth of the matter is that Guyana has the land space and it requires the population to make a critical mass that would that would aid Guyana's development much more rapidly. With a larger population, it will be able to absorb that money that it will that will be earning for oil in economic projects and development projects that will make more sense because your population will be larger. What Guyana could become. Uh, the place of refuge for its West Indian brothers and sisters. And at the same time, in bring into the country people who will be able to help with its development. People of your own race, your own culture, your own uh, background, your own, your own everything. Uh, they're, they're, they're symbiotic relationship between uh, Guyanese and West Indians go back for centuries. It is something that binds us together. So there are possibilities on the, in the economic front for both Guyana and for CARICOM of a continued relationship. So Ron, what would you say to us? Uh, look, a lot of people in Guyana are, we're kind of wringing our hands presently because uh, it's one pitfall after another. We have had successive governments in Guyana that have signed on or have signed poor contracts with our companies. We have seen, for example, as we speak, over 9 billion cubic feet of gas has been flared by Exxon. When you look at the contracts, when you speak to those in authorities, there is always some push and pull, and it goes to, to uh, circling the wagons because political decisions have been taken. How do we how do we hold our politicians accountable? It, it, because what is the other pitfall of this election engineering is that governments are now going to say, we're not going to give up power. What do we say to the people? Well, I, I think the question, the issue is more fundamental than that, if I may. Um, look, ExxonMobil is a company it's plenty bigger than, Gaia, than Gaia. Its resources financially, its outreach, its uh, tentacles are long and wide and deep and influential. And Exxon is not the only oil company in Guyana. There are others who are, which are in a similar position. I don't know about the contracts because I've not looked at them. I have no idea whether they are fair or unfair. I've heard, of course, the uh, remarks made by people who ought to know uh, about the unevenness of some of those contracts. That may be so or not. That's not the point I, I would like to make. The point I would like to make is this, that Guyana cannot confront any of these countries unless it is a united Guyana. Right. Because once you are a divided Guyana, once you are divided politically, you give an opportunity to your enemies and those with whom you have a competition, work one side off against the other. And if there's a country in the world that should understand divide and rule, Guyana has to be it. So if you haven't learned from that, that lesson after all of these years and don't recognize that the only thing that will stand up to the powers outside is the United Guyana, then you've learned nothing. And therefore, history will repeat itself and you deserve what you get. But I know this, if Guyana were to take a united stance, if its governance were in the hands of 
mechanisms which the Guyanese people respected, uh, were loyal to, were faithful to, and, and gave the power to, Guyana would do much better in its international negotiations than it would do in its present circumstances or at any period in its past. One of the things that we have to learn, as trade unions learned it when they were fighting for workers' rights in Guyana and elsewhere in the Caribbean, there is strength in unity. And that thing that says solidarity forever, it means something. If it were not for those trade unions unifying to fight against the employer class, workers would never have achieved anything, including incidentally their political rights, because it is out of that unity of trade unionism that political parties came. And they came not to fight each other, they came to fight the colonial power for the rights of the indigenous people, people of the countries. Now, if we knew that that was, that was what allowed ordinary workers, cane cutters, people who were breaking bricks for a living, mm -hmm. uh, if we recognize that that is what pulled them up, why don't we understand that that is still the tool at our disposal? and one which we absolutely need if uh, we are to go forward. When I say we, incidentally, in this particular context, I just don't mean Guyana. I mean every developing country that is in a similar situation. And one of the things about Guyana and Caricom is that if Guyana were united and were standing up in the international community for its rights, it would give leadership to other countries in the Caribbean that need the strength of Guyana to lead the way. And they would join Guyana in that battle. And a unified CARICOM could be a powerful thing. Believe me, I've seen it happen. When in the Organization of American States, 14 CARICOM countries of 34 member states stand up and uni in unity say, this is what we stand for. This is the principle for which we will fight. We win every time. When we lose is when Countries of CARICOM allow themselves to be picked off by others, to split us apart, and therefore that power of 14 becomes the weakness of 14 individual countries. Then we hang separately rather than hang together. All right. So, Ron, um, recently, in fact, this this week gone by, you, you recognize the continued uh, and I want to use the word investment, the continued investment of CARICOM in Guyana. You spoke eloquently about the relationship, symbiotic relationship, CARICOM Guyana. Recently, you spoke about the most uh, the, the, the real and live investment of CARICOM in Guyana's affairs, and that is the, the observers we have here, sir. And to that point, you mentioned that you know you salute the CARICOM three. In fact, you said we salute the CARICOM three for their sacrifice. You highlighted the sacrifice in that, uh, in terms of them leaving their families. You also drew attention to the fact that our the goalposts would have shifted for the from the 25 days now to June 16th. Um, sir, if you don't mind, uh, what's the the thought of your colleagues, distinguished men and women like yourself? And I, I ask you this because Sir James was on our program, as you recall, Sir James, former PM of Saint Vincent and Grenadine. Grenad and he was very eloquent in saying, like what you are, look, the world is watching and we want you guys to get better. Will CARICOM continue to support and will you, Sir Ronald, continue to support post-elections? Let us just assume there is a declaration for us to change our winner-take-all politics. Well, you know, that winner take all policies needs to be changed in other the Guyana. You you look when you look at uh, at elections because of Guyana's relationship of race to politics, the tribalism for you tends to be in Indian and black terms. But the rest of the Caribbean is no different except that it doesn't there's a difference of that there is not color, but it's the same tribalism. Uh, the same winner-take-all happens in St. Kitts Nevis, in Antigua, Barbuda, in Jamaica, uh, in Barbados. Um, it happens everywhere. 
because that's the nature of the parliamentary system that we all inherited uh, at independence from the United Kingdom. Uh, now, that may work for the United Kingdom because it is a very large country and it has checks and balances and all sorts of other uh, separations of power that we tend to have in smaller countries where people know each other and everybody has a cousin or an uncle. Uh, somebody is going to open a door for you, whether it's meritorious or not. Uh, in Britain, it tends not to be that way uh, because the population is larger. Uh, there are far too many people coming out of very good universities like Oxford and Cambridge and Sussex and uh, Warwick and others where people are actually competing. And, and, it's hard, and it's hard for you to run away from competition. In the Caribbean, it's, it, you know, it's easy to do. But the point is, um, the winner-take-all attitude does not just exist in uh, exist throughout the Caribbean. The system needs to be changed. We need to move away from the winner-take-all uh, attitude because you know, a, a, in, a, in, in some countries, a government wins uh, an election by one seat, in one seat. And then we go through all kinds of shenanigans to make sure that that one seat does not cross the floor, does not have the ability to do it, even though the person who was elected differently in Guyana because you have proportional representation, but in other parts of the Caribbean is still a constituency based representative democracy, where there is somebody standing in the constituency to be elected. So when that person is elected, that person becomes the representative in parliament of that particular area. Now, um, that person should be able to exercise his conscience or her conscience in relation to the constituency he or she supports. It shouldn't be just because the government tells you you must vote this way and you happen to have been elected on the government's party ticket. That you are that you are, you are blind to your own conscience. Um, so we we have to look at the system and make sure it is more reflective of people and of areas, uh, and that there are people to whom you can hold there is accountability. It, it I mean in, in Guyana, you have no idea who's going to end up in your parliament because you have lists. And that list is controlled by one person in the opposition and another person to go. And that person can change anybody on that list at any time. And if anybody on that list says something the leader of that party doesn't like, then you have what is interestingly called recall legislation. You send that person packing and put in somebody else who will do your bidding. So there's no but there's no there's nobody who's standing up and saying, hey, you know, you may be the leader, but you're wrong. And we need you to look at this a little more closely than you've been doing in the past. Because you as a leader know that from the time he says that and he's a troublemaker, he's recalled, faced by somebody else. The systems are wrong. The systems have lost their uh, representation of the people. And that's what parliaments are supposed to be about. And we need to get back to that point. And governments themselves have to understand that because you win an election uh, does not mean everybody who did not vote for you no longer has a voice, no longer has a concern, no longer has a right. Uh, these things have to, have to be addressed differently. And we have to start looking at our constitutional systems and addressing them properly. Now, I don't know of any political party who will like what I just said to you, because every political party that I know of has always argued against the system until they become the government. And then it's business as usual. Very true. So but the argument has to start before governments. It has to start and start seriously across the board in the society. Correct. But Saran, you, you might have... Uh, 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 being part, uh, well, you would have been there. Um, I don't know how much engaged you might have been, but Guyana's recall legislation has its roots in some deep-seated emotions. I mean, in the 1960s, late 1960s, I think Mohamed Safi 
a PPP person would have crossed the floor and stayed over on the other side permanently. And so when the PPP saw it was boycotting parliament, it was actually in parliament because one of its members decided to cross the floor. And then you moved on to later years when, uh, you know, they, they basically put that recall legislation. And, and point to note, we had Charandas Passad recently, and he said, it is his opinion, that when uh, one of the ministers in parliament asked for that two minutes, two minutes break, in parliament after he moved after he voted yes that two minutes break could have seen him ousted from parliament because of the so some of these things are are like you know patches are like plaster band-aids you put to 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 do something but it's not work because the long term we are where we are because people don't have to you just have to be loyal well that's the problem um politic politicians um particularly politicians in government, tend to think only up to the next election and what has to be done to retain power. It's not a question of, the, uh, you know, people need to start thinking, why am I in politics at all? Is it for my benefit? Or did I want to become into politics so I could serve people? And if it is that you wanted to serve people, then the agenda would be different from if you wanted to serve yourself. You know. Uh, Politics should not be a career. It should be something you do because you want to serve. And it shouldn't be forever. You, there should be a limit on which, on how long you serve um, in that capacity. Because the thing about power, as it's been said for ages, is that the thing about power is that it corrupts. And people who get it don't like to get, don't like to give it up. That, that is why they must be made to give it up by limitations, by limits being placed on what they can do. Uh, you know, everybody should have to go back to going into the private sector and struggling for a living. Demonstrate whether or not you really have the capacity to do something other than persuade people to vote for you. That's right. Uh, you know, actually go and compete, be made to deliver. Uh, it's a tough world out there outside of politics. Politics is an easy ride which is why people like to hold on to it. I'm, you know, I, I'm not saying every politician is like that, let me be clear. Uh, but politicians have to understand that politics is not about them. It's about the service they give to the people who elected them. And until we get to that point, you know, this, this is always going to be what it is, I'm afraid. Now that may sound to you to be very uh, idealistic and romanticist and so on. And you wonder why a 72-year-old man would be saying that. Well, because a 70-year-old man has been around this thing for a very long time. And, uh, and I have been disgusted by it. I've been frustrated by it. I've been encouraged by some things that I saw. I've been elated by others. But mostly, it's been frustration. And you know, that photograph that uh, Mr. Gildari was talking about that he saw recently, of me and Pancho Kuru and Matthew Allen and Vivian Harrison and Terry Holder uh, was taken in 1974. Mm -hmm. I was 26 years <laughs> old. I had become the general manager of a public corporation at the age of 25. I, I admit I was precocious throughout my life. Everybody in that photograph, apart from me, is not with us today. Part of the reason is that I was much younger than them. But um, I've been on a long learning curve. And I, if I have any romanticism left in me and idealism, such as I've just uh, uh, said to you, that is because I firmly believe it. Absolutely. I believe the role of politicians must be to serve the people who elect them. Absolutely. It must not be for the people they serve. The people who elected them to serve them. It's the other way around. And Thank that you. message has to be read loud and clear. And unless people start to practice it, the divisions we see today, this lust for power, this desire to hold on to it, not going to change. So in a sense, we've got to put legislation in place that stops people being able to serve for all that length of time. You know, should, should people be in parliament for more than two terms? I, for me, two terms is enough. If you haven't done what you set out to do in two terms, you'll never do it. In any event, there are brighter and younger people who are coming up behind you. Of course. 
uh, who will learn from your experience, but they will bring innovation and they will bring creativity. They bring a new attitude. And all of that is important. Change is what makes the world spin. And it's what it's what pushes development. Without without change, we will stagnate. We'll be paralyzed. We'll just be nothing. Uh, we'll gonna be like pigs caused, caught in the mud. Mm -hmm. So that is why uh, limitations on political power must also be in our constitutions, frankly, not just in Guyana, but across the board in the Caribbean. Correct. Leonard? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Along the same theme, uh, Sauron, on the issue of change, our people have been voting race for a very, very long time. And I want to ask you, sir, what is needed for people to start voting issues and not race? Well, part, part of the thing has to start with the political parties themselves. Political parties, you, if I were to ask you, what's the ideological difference between the PPP and the APNU AFC? Is there an ideological difference? Is one communist? Is one capitalist? Does one believe more in the private sector than the other? Is one more pragmatic? Is one more practical? I mean, what's the ideology? What is it about these two parties? If I were a young person trying to think, well, I'd like to make a contribution through politics. So let me figure which of these two parties is more akin with my own thinking. What do I look for in these parties? What do they tell me they stand for? What's the ideology that I'm, I'm voting for? What can I expect? Are you private sector based? Are you in favor of no income taxes? Are you, do you believe the private sector is the engine of development or do you believe government must intervene? I mean, what is it? If anybody can tell me what the difference is between these two parties right now, I might be able to say to you, that's a basis for moving away from race politics. But the truth is the matter. I, don't, I suspect it has nothing to do with ideology, nothing to do with a different position on how a country should develop. It has to do with only one thing. And that is the idea that one party represents one race and another party represents another. Now, what clearly has to happen is that people have to stop thinking that political parties serve them best on the basis of race, because they don't. Political parties will only serve you well when you are in command of what the political parties do. The political parties are not your bosses. You are not their servants. It's the other way around. And that's the lesson we all have to learn. Hopefully, young people must, must learn it, because if they're the basis for change, I say, if your party is based on race, that's not a reason for me to vote for you. If your party stands for something else, if it stands for what money you're going to put into education, whether you think looking after old people after they reach the age of 65 is important in our society, our society or they should be discarded, whether you think women should play a greater role in our society, whether they should be paid equally with men, whether homosexuality has a role, has a, a place in our society, all of those are issues that should be that should be issues that determine where a political party stands. But I defy anybody to tell me that the PPP or the APNU AFC or the PNC behind all of that have any particular difference in the way in which they approach these questions. Which for me would be the only reason I could vote for either one of them. But certainly wouldn't be voting for them on the basis of race. So, Ron, earlier you talked about, you mentioned the, the, the seriousness of, of not having these, uh, the, the uh, outcome of the elections, um, not having it reflecting the will of the electorate. Supposing, sir, hypothetically, supposing there are no, de there, there is no declaration. Supposing, because what we have presently is there, there seems to be so much anomalies that a question is being asked as to the credibility of these elections. Those questions can probably lead to and uh, encouraging the chairman to say it is so bad that you cannot uh, you cannot make a declaration. What would be your what's your thoughts to that? Sir? Well, I must tell you that I have a fundamental problem with GCOM itself. And I, I want to tell you why I'm saying that. On a piece of paper, you read what GCOM is. And it sounds like it's a very responsible, very independent body. But how can anybody be independent 
if its commissioners are made up of representatives of political parties who are coming into that commission with a political position. Tell me, tell me how that could be independent. Right. And then if you have uh, uh, a chairman whose role is not simply to be the chair and to be a deciding vote in the instance of independent commissioners not being able to agree. And let us go back to what I'm just saying. You can't have an independent body made up of politicians right. serving the interests of a political party. By its very definition, that's not an independent body. So uh, I, I have a fundamental problem with the way GCOM is structured. And if I were to if I were to be asked what would you set up in its place, I'd say something in which political parties don't have a role. That the GCOM, the things that sets up the electoral machinery for the country, must be put in the hands of sectoral representatives of the country. So maybe the bar association, the medical association, the uh, the, the trade unions association. Political parties may have a nominating capacity too, because they represent something, uh, ostensibly the people who belong to their parties, but not exclusively. This shouldn't be a matter between the president and the leader of the opposition to determine who the chairman should be and then uh, what members should be on it because they appoint them. It must be a truly independent body, independent of the politician. Political parties could have a say in it, but not the sole say. And then you have an independent body. Then what that independent body does, people may have a little more confidence in and may trust a little more than they do now. But what you are having GCOM at GCOM at the moment is a fight between the political parties. It's the same power struggle going on. Absolutely. Exactly Absolutely. the same power struggle going on. It Absolutely. can never be independent. I hope that despite all of that, this recount process in which CARICOM has invested an awful lot of energy, time, and money, and in which three people have sacrificed so far, I don't know what, 20 something days of their lives in conditions that I would challenge anybody to want to go and do. You go to a different country, you go, you wake up in the morning in a hotel that has nobody in it except you. It doesn't have a restaurant, so you can't even go buy a, you can't go to a restaurant and have a meal. You can't have a drink. You go off for the entire day of your life, sitting, watching people counting, and then you go home to an empty hotel, which still doesn't have a restaurant, no bar to it, and more than that is a curfew. You can't even go out of the hotel to someplace because there's no place open. And you live that life under that stressful situation and with people who are hostile to you every day because they don't think you should be there observing anything. Even though you were invited to do the observation. And incidentally, those people are volunteers. Nobody compelled them to go. They weren't, they weren't pressured to they volunteer. And why did they volunteer? They volunteered because they believe that elections should be free and fair, and that the result of the election should be the determination of the will of the people. Oh, that's right. I, I say all of that to say that there's fundamental change needed everywhere. And GCOM is certainly amongst the places that needs fundamental change. Thank you, sir. And indeed, I mean, let me say on behalf of our, our viewers and listeners and readers, tomorrow newspaper and yesterday's and so forth, uh, indeed, we owe uh, you know our gratitude to we share your your sentiments, sir, and our gratitude to CARICOM and the observer team there. That is no easy task. And Leonard, those three persons are there now. Remember, the political parties would change their reps, but these three persons are there day after day. So, Ron, what would you say? Given all of this turmoil, given everything that's happening presently, given the the this. 88, 89 days that we have, and it will be 106 by the time we are finished. What would you say to the next government, sir? Well, I, the next government, uh, I would say, first of all, understand your government of the people of Guyana, all of them, whatever race they may be, whatever class they may be, whatever part of the country they live in, you are the government of those people. Try your best to reflect the will of those people, their ambitions, their aspirations, their desires. And you know, you can boil those things down very easily. Not much. What do people want? 
they want they want a, a decent wage. They want to be able to pay their way in the world. They want to own a piece of land. They want to have a house on which they can live in that land. They want to have their children go to schools and have decent schooling. And they want their children to be able to educate it so they could compete, not just in Guyana, but in the world. They want, they want one day to be able to say, look at what we Guyanese have achieved. Look at these monuments that we have that stand for something, that show who we are as a people. Uh, and, and they want when they, they don't want their rights to be brutalized and abused. They don't want them taken away from them. They want to celebrate them. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. And I watched Washington, D.C. today. And it was tragic. I could not believe that this was the United States. This could have been Tiananmen Square in China. It could have been Hong Kong a few weeks ago. It could have been what they used to call the Arab Spring. Well, this is a U.S. Spring because there are people out on the streets here who are fighting to be recognized. People who are saying, look, my life matters, matters. And other people like me, our lives matter. What is striking is that there, those black people who are saying that are being joined by an awful lot of white people who are saying the same thing. And why are they saying it? Because, you know, today it's your life that doesn't matter. Tomorrow it may be mine. So the struggle has to be joint and collective. But governments have to understand, people have rights. People of all colors, all races, all religions have rights. And your job as a government is to ensure that those rights are protected, preserved, and upheld in every way, economically, socially, politically. Look after people, that's why you were elected. Thank you, Sir Ron. Well said. Leonard? Yes, I, I may have a question with regards to organizations like OAS and CARICOM. Is this a wake-up call for us to do things differently? And I'm talking elections 2020 for Guyana. Or who to do uh, things differently? That is CARICOM and the OAS. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Maybe in, in terms for, of what for a long time, we would have uh, seen criticisms coming out that CARICOM is a talk shop. Well, not so much OAS. OAS is not really in the picture there. But CARICOM because of the headquarters being here and so on. So I want to ask you if if you believe uh, that uh, CARICOM may have to do things, maybe put its foot a, a down a little harder. Well, you know, it's it's CARICOM, we have to remember, is at the end of the day, a community of sovereign states, mm -hmm. part of our problem. That uh, it's not a federation, it's not a political union, there's not a central government that can tell the parts of CARICOM what to do. Because it is a community of sovereign states, each country is sovereign and has the right to do what it wants to do. What the integration movement was intended to do, better was to cause each country to take a piece of its sovereignty and pool it with the others to make their joint sovereignty stronger. That's what it's meant to be. Now, part of any collaboration and integration movement with countries is that countries should have similar values, similar principles. Because if I'm of one, uh, if I hold some values to be important and you don't, then you will always be the odd man out. You will be the outlier and you will always cause a problem. Frankly, I believe we have that difficulty right now with Haiti uh, because Haiti is not uh, a country with which other countries in the Caribbean have had a long experience. We of the Commonwealth Caribbean, uh, that core group of 13, have been part of a system for, 30, for, for well over for almost 300 years. Whereas Haiti was a different kind of kettle of fish. Uh, right now, Haiti is president, is running the country by decree. The, he, he sets up one government after another that doesn't last because the assembly uh, rejects it. But there is a country with deep-seated problems and its values are not the same as ours. And uh, so in the Organization of American States, for instance, uh, when CARICOM takes a position, we can be pretty sure that most of the time Haiti is not with CARICOM, with somebody else. 
Um, and that weakens CARICOM. Now, at some point, what CARICOM will have to do is to look at all of its member states and say, we have a charter. This is the charter we all say we adhere to. This is the criteria we, we, by which you, every member state of CARICOM is judged. And if any of you are not equal to that criteria, then you shouldn't be a member of CARICOM. And the choice is yours. You either correct your act, get your act together, and become like the rest of us, or leave. But you can't stay. So to answer your question, um, CARICOM itself, governments have to think about what they want in the future. Do we want uh, 14 governments that are small, weak, uh, unable to advance their own cause in the international community? Or are we going to have a closer union, which makes the 14 countries much stronger than we are, and therefore more powerful in the international community, than they, than they can possibly be as 14 individual and very weak states? Now, that also comes back down to politicians. Are politicians willing to give up the fact that uh, in each of their countries, they are prime ministers and they are ministers of this and that, uh, to have just one prime minister and to have one minister of agriculture mm -hmm. uh, in 14 places, to have policy making at a different level so that you have centralized powers or in the, in the center and then devolve powers on the others so that some countries become run as local governments rather than as a national government. That for the Caribbean is the ideal answer because it gives us all kinds of opportunities, freedom of movement between all 14 countries on, on travel. Uh, one single currency that I can leave Guyana and go to Antigua and spend mm -hmm. the same money. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about an immigration officer asking me, what am I doing here? Because I've, you know, I've just left one part of my country to go to another. It'd be going, like, going from Kitty to Georgetown. Um, but if we don't move in that direction, that I'm afraid CARICOM itself will eventually become so weak, uh, so enfeebled, that it will fall apart. And if it is faced with crises, and we're going to have a big test in a few months' time, probably in a few weeks' time, we're all ravaged by the coronavirus. Everybody's ravaged by it. Economies have taken a beating. Now, Guyana was supposed to have an 82% growth this year. I see they've now reduced it to 56%. If the virus continues, if the debts continues, if business continues to contract, even with oil, you're going to go down below that 50% bar. But in other parts of the Caribbean, not a single one of them will have 1% growth this year. None. Now, if on top of that, uh, that virus, we have a hurricane in the Caribbean this year. And if it hits more than one country, at that point, we are in serious trouble. Uh, which is why, you know, governments of small countries can't cope with these realities. We, we need a bigger unit. Now, I've been saying that forever. My master's dissertation many years ago was on integration in the Caribbean. I looked at all possible op uh, options of what we could do other than integrate amongst ourselves, including it becoming the states of the United States, where all that we would become is dwarfed into nothing, and our culture would disappear, and who we are. I looked at the same relationship with Canada and came to the same conclusion. I knew we could no, possibly have no relationship other than that of neighborliness with the Latin Americans because they have no regard for us. Um, and of course, they speak a different language. Uh, their culture is different. Everything is different. We couldn't possibly have maintained a, continue to maintain a colonial relationship with the United Kingdom. So where were we to go? The only place we could go is amongst ourselves to build something bigger and better, a more perfect union that we have. Uh, I still believe that that is the Caribbean's future and its salvation, including Guyana's. But that may be a long time coming, and I'll probably be dead and gone before it happens, if it happens. I sincerely hope it does. Uh, it's something I've worked for all my life, and that I will continue to do. But I know that um, institutions like CARICOM do have uh, 
better to look at themselves more closely. But that again will, it comes back to the politicians in the national units. How much are they willing to give? How mm -hmm. much sovereignty are they willing to concede? How much power are they themselves willing to give up? Right. Even though that power that they have, they only exercise it against one set of people, you know. You know who those people are? Their own. <laughs> so true. So, Ronald, we are coming down to program time, and I think uh, all of Guyana and our brothers and Guyanese overseas are better off tonight after this chat with you, sir. I do wish we could have another chat with you sometime after these elections because it, it it's interesting. I'm intrigued by your thoughts on the Caribbean integration, and I would have loved to talk a little bit about your thoughts on common currency, common passports, and all of that. Uh, because we have to look at building the future. But, sir, it's been very interesting to garner your, uh, gather your thinking and share them with us here tonight uh, with regards to these elections, especially because that's what's consuming this entire nation. So, Ron, your final thoughts, sir. Well, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and, and with Leonard and through you with uh, the people who have uh, watched and listened to this. Uh, nothing I've said to you tonight is not something I sincerely believe. Uh, incidentally, I believe in God because I believe in Guyanese. Uh, I looked the other day, I, I got the other day uh, uh, chronicles of the Queen's College School magazine and the lecture, going back to 1920 some up until the present day. And if you go through those lectures and there was uh, those magazines. My brother, for instance, edited it uh, between the years of 1953 and 1955. Um, and uh, I looked at what he and others were writing, and I looked at who were his contemporaries, who was coming into the universe, uh, into this Queen's College as he was leaving. Now, as he was, as he was uh, a prefect, who was coming in? Walter Rodney, Orsworth McAndrew, uh, who had gone before? Fred Wills, Sonny Ramphill, uh, people uh, that uh, whose names uh, maybe don't mean a lot to people in Guyana today. But you know, at Queen's College, it was a time on a board, on a shield, it listed all of the names of every uh, person from Queen's College who had bought the Guyana scholarship. Every boy coming into that school wanted to see his name up on that board one day. And if not on that board, at least mentioned in the, in the Queen's College magazine, that somebody would achieve something. But you go through that, that, and you go through that magazine, you look at those names, and you see where they went to in the world, what they achieved. And it tells you that Guyanese have a fantastic capacity. No matter what race they were, the names there are Hughes and Chinaloy and um, uh, Trinilal. Ramphal, Singh, mm -hmm. Kassad, Wills. Uh, uh, one of the uh, magazines I looked at that my brother edited, the man who was the, the cricket captain, um, eventually became uh, uh, a commissioner of police uh, in Guyana. And why his name escapes me right now, I don't know if I, I can see his face. But uh, the point is, we produced fantastic people who even today are still making a contribution in many parts of the world. You go to John Hopkins University, you will find cancer specialists born in Guyana. Uh, if you go to hospitals in Canada on the front line of fight, fighting COVID right now, are either Guyanese or right. children of Guyanese. Right. Um, I have a cousin, you're much younger than me, who's one of them. Um, they are, they're, the Guyana has produced fantastic people. Therefore, it has fantastic people. And it has all the potential for making a nation that is meaningful in the world. It has one single obstacle to overcome, and that is the foolishness of race. Did you hear what I said? The foolishness of race, because that's all it is. Indeed, indeed. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, all across Guyana, the Caribbean, and wider world. Sir Ronald Saunders sharing with us his thoughts about these elections, politics, and of course, our wonderful future, if we can be a united Guyana. 
Sir Ronald, thank you so very much. It's been a privilege to have you here, sir, and we look forward for another such experience. Well, thank you very much. Thank you I've, very much. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation with you both. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this is it from room 592. Join us tomorrow night as we talk. We have a chat with Mr. Oren Gordon, who is the former editor-in-chief of the Trinidad Guardian in room 592, where we unleash the truth. Have a good night, one and all. Thanks to Kevin Smith and Joshua Van Slitman. Of course, my co-host, Leonard Gildari Please. and Glenn Lal, the owner of this entire outfit. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Ron, good night and be safe now. Bye-bye. Thank you.